Despite what you've been told, SpaceX's next commercial mission, Polaris Dawn, is neither crazy nor overly risky. To frame it in that context does a disservice to the SpaceX employees who have been working for years on this mission and the Polaris Dawn crew who have been training for years on this mission. Instead, what we're seeing is an evolution of how things have traditionally been with government-run missions to how things will become with commercial missions. This evolution is so new, it's so nascent, this, this entire industry is just in its beginning formation that people don't really know how to talk about it. And I understand calling it crazy and risky for the clickbait titles, but that is truly the wrong framing. Instead, we should be looking at this as a triumph of how companies, specifically SpaceX in this case, have been able to commercialize spaceflight, make it safe and push limits that not only advance human spaceflight in general, but also advance the goals of the company and ultimately make the company more profitable and sustainable. Which for those of us who talk about a space-faring civilization and talk about a space ecosystem, like that is what our goal is, isn't it? That is the future that I personally hope to see. And my name is Lara Forsick. I'm the executive director of space consulting firm Astrolytical. I've already done a whole video on why Polaris Dawn is not space tourism, why it instead should be considered a commercial technical development mission, which you can watch that whole video next. I highly recommend it because already I'm seeing headlines talking about how this is space tourism and it really truly isn't. And sprinkled amongst those headlines are words like crazy and risky because those are what capture people's attention but those are inaccurate words to describe what Polaris Dawn and the Polaris program are. What we're seeing is a misframing due to the fact that SpaceX is a commercial company, not a government-run agency. Because if NASA or any other government was attempting to do something like this, it would be called neither crazy nor risky. I do want to put in the caveat that human spaceflight is never not risky. Although safety is often the number one consideration, it can never be truly safe. There is always some level of risk that needs to be taken in human spaceflight. So SpaceX first did a fully commercial free-flying mission on Dragon for Inspiration4 back in 2021. It was seen as an obvious step. You know, SpaceX had already been doing missions where it took humans to the International Space Station and back. So it seemed like the next step to just have a Dragon instead of dock to the space station, just hang out in orbit for a few days. And that mission was a complete success. A lot of people don't know this. In fact, I didn't know it until I read it in a Florida Today article, which I will link below, that it was Elon Musk who approached Jared Isaacman about doing the Polaris Dawn milestones, the high altitude and the EVA and the other things that we're going to discuss. So it was the CEO of SpaceX who proposed this mission to a commercial customer, Jared Isaacman, who claims that he didn't think that he'd fly in space again. But based on what he said in various interviews, I completely think that he expected to fly in space again. So on Polaris Dawn, we have a crew that is highly qualified. These are not space tourists. These are not like newbie rookies. Although three of them have not flown in space before, they are so very qualified, just like any other rookie astronaut would be qualified to fly on their first mission. Jared Isaacman, of course, has already flown. He is the mission commander. And I'm briefly going to go over some of these bios just so you know that these are not just nobodies. These are highly trained professionals. So Jared has 7,000 flight hours of aviation experience. He has flown in over 100 air shows, which I would love to know if someone knows statistics on how risky air shows are, because I would bet that's highly risky comparable to or more than space flight. He has ratings in multiple experimental and ex-military aircraft. And he holds several world records, including 2008 and 2009 speed around the world flight. Scott Kid Poteet is the mission pilot, and he also has extensive experience in aircraft as a combat pilot for the U.S. Air Force. 20 years in various roles, including the Thunderbirds, over 3,200 flying hours in F-16, A-4, T-38, T-37, T-3, and Alpha Jet, 400 hours of combat time, and he was the mission director for Inspiration4. So even though he has never been to space before, he has space experience being the mission director for that first commercial space flight. Sarah Gillis is a SpaceX employee. She is a mission specialist for Polaris Dawn. Her title was lead space operations engineer at SpaceX, and she oversaw astronaut training. Specifically, she trained the Inspiration4 crew. And not just for Inspiration4, but for Demo2, 
That's the mission in 2020, that first human spaceflight mission on a Dragon, as well as Crew-1. And then there's Anna Menon, who is also a SpaceX employee. She is a mission specialist and also the medical officer for Polaris Dawn. She holds the title of Lead Space Operations Engineer at SpaceX, where she managed the development of crew operations and served as mission director and crew communicator. She served in mission control during Demo-2, Crew-1, CRS-22, CRS-23, Crew-3, Crew-4, and Axiom-1. Any one of those people could be a government-chosen astronaut but they are not. They are commercial astronauts. And that's where the differentiation is in some people's minds. That because it's a commercial company, and because it's a commercial mission, and because these are commercial astronauts, that this is somehow a riskier mission or a crazy mission, when in fact it is very similar to things that have been done in the past with government missions. For example, talked about quite a bit, is the first commercial EVA. It is the first time that a cabin is going to be completely depressurized on purpose so that two crew members can exit the vehicle tethered and two crew members are going to stay inside, but they're all going to don new spacesuits. And the new spacesuits part, that could be considered a little bit risky because you never quite know. Is this risky? Well, of course it's risky, but is it riskier than any other spacewalk? So spacewalks right now are tend to be routine, but think back to 1965, the very first spacewalk. Alexei Leonov, if you know anything about spaceflight history, you know that a lot of things went wrong during that mission. I mean, he had to bleed off some of the air within his spacesuit just to get back inside. There were other things that went wrong with that mission. It, that was risky. And the difference there, of course, was it was early human spaceflight. And so it seemed to be that the risk tolerance was higher back then, but also it was a government-run mission. If the Polaris Dawn crew was doing the first EVA ever, then yeah, absolutely it would be super risky, but they're not. We now have decades of experience. Not only has the Polaris Dawn crew and the SpaceX team been preparing for this, they actually delayed the mission because they wanted to be absolutely sure that the spacesuits are ready, that the EVA was all planned out, that everything was going to go according to plan. And that's another thing I think is overlooked, is that this mission was announced in February 2022. And the crew was already decided at that time. So they have been preparing, they have been training for two and a half years. They are not rushing this, they are not ill prepared. Everybody is on the same page and working together to make sure this becomes a success. Another thing that people are criticizing this mission for, maybe not criticizing, but pointing out that it is slightly riskier, is the radiation environment. Because of the highly elliptical orbit that Polaris Dawn is going to do, it's going to take them low into the South Atlantic anomaly, which increases their exposure to radiation, as well as high to 1,400 kilometers, which increases their radiation. To give you some context, the International Space Station is around 420 kilometers. It, it, it varies. 420 kilometers compared to 1,400 kilometers. I mean, that, that's a big jump, but it's still in low Earth orbit. And so while they will have more radiation exposure, it should not be more than a typical International Space Station expedition. And not only that, we have sent crews further. We, we being humanity, have sent crews further out to the moon and back. They're also not staying up in a high altitude for very long. It's about 10 hours that they're planning to stay up to 1,400 kilometers. So it's not actually that much exposure to a higher altitude. And they're going to come back down to a more normal altitude that we expect just based on what we expect from the International Space Station. And I feel like there's such a disconnect when we talk about what is typically done with government astronauts and what these commercial astronauts are doing, because there's still a disconnect in some people's minds, a lot of people's minds, about what government astronauts and government agencies are capable of and what commercial astronauts and commercial companies are capable of. And it really harkens back in my mind. It really reminds me of how SpaceX was treated prior to 2020 when the commercial coup program was going on. And, you know, we, we've seen this a lot in the news lately that SpaceX was the underdog. SpaceX was seen as risky. And we have seen over the past four years that SpaceX's way of doing things has been working when it comes to human spaceflight. But apparently that hasn't alleviated the worry in some people's minds. For example, after the decision was made just on Saturday about SpaceX returning the Boeing Starliner astronauts to Earth rather than them returning on Starliner, there was a statement put out by two members of Congress, Zoe Lothgren and, and Eric Sorensen. I'm not going to read this whole thing, but I just want to point out this bottom sentence here, this last sentence where they say, the 
implications of the commercial crew public-private partnership experiment. Public-private partnership experiment. That implies that it is a temporary thing that we are trying out to see how it's working. And for those of you just unfamiliar what this is talking about, it's talking about the experiment of retiring space shuttles and having NASA contract with SpaceX and Boeing to fly astronauts to the International Space Station and back. And that experiment is the reason why NASA has had reliable transportation to the International Space Station for its astronauts for the past four years. If not for that experiment, then we'd still be relying on the Russian Soyuz exclusively to take astronauts to the ISS and back. There's almost endless money that could be thrown into a government program if that government decides to do so. Whereas a company needs to be profitable. It needs to have a return on investment. But that does not mean unsafe. That does not mean taking unnecessary risks because SpaceX knows if they mess up, everybody's eyes are on them. If Polaris Dawn goes wrong and there's no guarantee that everything's going to go right, they mean, like I said, spaceflight is inherently risky. There might be something that goes wrong. But if they are taking unnecessary risks, then that puts into question everything that SpaceX is doing for NASA when it comes to human spaceflight. That is the transportation to the National Space Station. That is the Artemis program transportation to the moon and back. And that puts into question other customers as well. Other customers like Axiom Space, who are taking astronauts to the ISS and back through SpaceX. And other customers like Fram2. So SpaceX knows for its future, it needs to ensure that Polaris Dawn is safe as safe as they reasonably can make it. Polariston is a testament to what a company can accomplish in this new era of commercial spaceflight. You know, this is just a transition period. And a decade or two from now, we're gonna look back on this as just the beginning. If I were to call Polariston anything, it would be audacious, it would be adventurous, and it's certainly exciting. In just a few hours, hopefully Polariston will be launching and I don't think I'll be awake, but I'm cheering them on in my sleep.